The Tribulation It will be a period of immense difficulty for Christians. Once the Antichrist is established as world dictator, he will turn his attention towards Christians. Sitting on a throne, he will declare that he himself is God and demand that all nations worship him as such. And anyone who swears allegiance to Jesus will be put to death. How will the Antichrist implement such a plan? The Mark of the Beast, a worldwide mandate that everyone must receive a mark in their forehead or in their hand. And without it, it will be impossible to buy or sell. And so the hunt will begin. A hunt to track down and kill every last Christian that resists until there's none remaining. This documentary is designed to help the Christian prepare spiritually for this final test of the end times. Should we, as Christians, expect to be on the earth during this time? How long will the tribulation last? What are the signs that it is approaching? And what will the tribulation itself be like? Throughout this documentary, we will be going through the Bible answering these questions. That way, if this does occur in our lifetime, we will be prepared. We hope you'll join us on our journey as we study the Great Tribulation. The first thing to understand about the tribulation is that it is a period of time set in the future. The Bible tells us many things about the past, beginning from the creation of Adam and Eve all the way down to Jesus Christ. But the tribulation is unique in that it is a period of time described in the Bible which hasn't occurred yet. Oftentimes, this subject is referred to as Bible prophecy. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly when the tribulation will occur. We just know that it will happen at some point in the future. Jesus' disciples asked Jesus about the tribulation in Matthew 24, verse 3. This verse says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Notice that the tribulation is connected to the end of the world. This means that each day that passes brings us closer and closer to it. The second thing to understand about the tribulation is that it is a time of great persecution of Christians. Today, we as Christians, particularly in America, are allowed to practice our religion with relative ease. We are permitted to attend church on Sunday, and profess our faith in the workplace with little to no consequence. During the tribulation, however, this will no longer be the case. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. According to this verse, the persecution of Christians during the tribulation will surpass any other time in history. 
The Bible actually says that so many Christians will be killed that if God didn't bring the tribulation to a close, there would be no more Christians alive in the entire world. The Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. According to this verse, if God didn't shorten the tribulation, not a single Christian would be saved. And lastly, the third thing to understand about the tribulation in that it is a definite period of time, which has a beginning and an ending. In fact, the Bible tells us exactly how many days the tribulation will last, 1,335 days. Daniel 12, verse 12 says, Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand, three hundred, and five, and thirty days. According to this verse, if a Christian waits until the 1,335th day of the tribulation, he will be blessed. We'll explain later on in this documentary why. Now that we have defined what the tribulation is, let's begin to investigate this time period in greater detail. One of the defining characteristics of the tribulation is worldwide unity. This unity will manifest itself in three distinct ways. A one world government, a one world currency, and a one world religion. First, let's begin by covering the one world government. In the world we live in today, there exist separate autonomous nations. The leader of Canada does not have power over Germany, and the leader of Germany does not have power over Canada. Each political leader has authority to govern its own respective nation. The Bible tells us that God is actually in support of this separation of power. In fact, he's the one who ordained it many years ago. In the Old Testament, before Noah's flood, humanity had gathered itself together into one group. Once united, mankind attempted to build a tower that reached all the way to heaven. This attempt is commonly referred to as the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11 verse 4 says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Notice, the reason mankind wanted to build the tower was so that they would remain as a unified group. God saw humanity's intent, and it displeased him. Consequently, God decided to separate mankind, using language as the divisive factor. Genesis 11 verses 6 and 7 say, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they began to do? And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Notice that what God had issue with was the fact that the people were one. What we can learn from this is that God is not in support of worldwide unity. One of the reasons God is not in support of worldwide unity is because it results in too high a concentration of power. And power, unfortunately, tends to corrupt those who hold it. You may be familiar with the Old Testament king of Israel named Saul. Saul started off as a lowly, humble man. After being made king, however, Saul became a tyrant and a murderer. He became addicted to his power, and anyone who posed a threat to his authority quickly became an enemy. Even in our modern history, there have been several examples of individuals who have gained too much unchecked power, and, as a result, they even began to genocide their own people. The reason God does not favor humanity united on a worldwide scale is because that much power in a single man's hand could become dangerous. That is exactly what is going to take place in the end times. 
The Bible tells us that in the latter days there will arise ten kings, which will have a majority stake in the world's political power. Revelation 17 verse 12 says, In the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These ten kings will then unite in their decision to make one man their ruler, the Antichrist. Revelation 17 verse 13 says, These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. According to this verse, the ten kings will give their power to the beast, which is the Antichrist. Imagine today if the leaders of the ten strongest nations in the world were to give their power to one man. That man would be the undisputed most powerful person in the world. That man will be the Antichrist. Today, we can see the one world government of the end times beginning to take shape. We see alliances such as the European Union and the United Nations in the congregating of world leaders to make united decisions in meetings such as the G7 summit. These formations of alliances will steadily continue until there are no more alliances to be made. It will just be one man calling the shots, and that man will be the Antichrist. We Christians can use the fact that we know the conclusion of the political arena ahead of time to our advantage. Oftentimes, it can be tempting to look towards political leaders to bring about some sort of reform. Perhaps a conservative candidate will be elected who will bring about a better world for our children to grow up in. But once it's understood that the world is not going to become better, in fact, it is actually going to become much worse, this hope of reformation from a political leader loses its poignancy. 2 Timothy 2 verse 4 says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. The Christian who understands that the conclusion of all elections is the inauguration of the Antichrist will be less moved by the constant ebb and flow of the Republican-Democratic struggle, because regardless of who gets elected, that candidate is only going to bring us one step closer to the Antichrist. And once we've realized that unfortunately, Washington offers us no hope of salvation, we can begin to focus our hope more entirely on the one who will bring about true reformation, and that is Jesus Christ. The Bible says that once the Antichrist is established into power, he will proclaim himself to be God in the flesh. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4 says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. According to this verse, the Antichrist is going to show that he himself is God, and anything that violates that precept will become an instant enemy. In order to accumulate his desired worship, the Antichrist will set up a statue of himself, oftentimes referred to in the Bible as an image, and will command that all nations worship that image. Revelation 13 verse 15 says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. According to this verse, anyone who does not worship the image of the Antichrist will be killed. That is going to pose a problem for those of us who desire to continue worshiping Jesus. In order to enforce his plan, the Antichrist will implement a worldwide mandate that everyone must receive a mark in their foreheads or in their hands. This mark is commonly referred to as the mark of the beast. Revelation 13 verse 16 says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, 
to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. A common theory which you may be familiar with is that the mark of the beast will be a microchip of some sort implanted into the recipient's hand or forehead. While the Bible does not specifically say that the mark of the beast will be a microchip, this theory does seem plausible and it should be a possibility that we as Christians should be aware of. Regardless of what the mark of the beast ends up being, those who do not accept it will be unable to buy or sell a single thing. Revelation 13 verse 17 says, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. According to this verse, if someone does not have the mark of the beast, he will be unable to buy or sell anything. This is going to put Christians in a dilemma, because, of course, we are going to want to eat, to pay our bills, and to feed our families. But God warns that anyone who does decide to worship the Antichrist and receive his mark, the punishment will far outweigh any potential benefit. This is because anyone who receives the mark of the beast or worship the Antichrist will be tortured with fire and brimstone. Revelation 14 verses 9 and 10 say, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. According to this verse, if someone does worship the Antichrist, or receive his mark, that person will be tormented with fire and brimstone. You may be wondering, why does God allow this to happen? Why doesn't God stop the Antichrist from coming into power? Couldn't God easily prevent this? As strange as it may sound, the Antichrist is acting in accordance with God's will. The Antichrist will serve a purpose. Inadvertently, the Antichrist will put Christians to the test. By commanding all nations to worship him, he will demand that Christians demonstrate their loyalty to Jesus Christ. Jesus says in Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. What we can learn from these verses is that Jesus desires for Christians to proclaim him, not just in secret, but before others. The Great Tribulation is our chance, as Christians, to do just that and some Christians will even pay the ultimate price because of it. The Bible says in Revelation 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Here, the Bible is describing Christians who have been beheaded because they refuse to worship the Antichrist and they refuse to receive the mark of the beast. But besides allowing Christians the opportunity to prove their loyalty towards their Savior, the Antichrist will serve another purpose as well. As we know, there are many people in the world today that do not believe in Jesus or God the Father. They have decided to worship another God or to worship no God at all. Needless to say, this decision does not please our Lord. Isaiah 42 verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Here, we learn that God does not desire to share his glory with false gods. The fact that the majority of the world has decided to worship false deities such as Allah or Buddha, Brahman or Mary angers our Lord and Savior. Consequently, God decides to send mankind a false god who will be very convincing 
and that false god will be the Antichrist. This is what the Bible refers to as strong delusion. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 11 says, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. Notice that God is the one who is sending them strong delusion. And what is that strong delusion? The strong delusion is the Antichrist. You may have noticed a trend in recent decades towards ecumenism when it comes to religion. Borders between religions are steadily falling. The lines between Judaism and Christianity, Catholicism and Islam are becoming more and more blurred. The notion that there is only one God and that each religion is a separate path to that God is quickly becoming a mantra among many religious figureheads. This trend towards a one-world religion will continue until it becomes an actual one-world religion, a religion whose God is the Antichrist. Revelation 13 verse 8 says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. According to this verse, every single person except born-again Christians whose names are in the book of life will worship the Antichrist. That means that every single Muslim in the world will worship the Antichrist. Every single Hindu will worship the Antichrist. Every single Jew will worship the Antichrist. Every single Buddhist will worship the Antichrist. Every single Catholic will worship the Antichrist. And every single atheist will worship the Antichrist. You may be wondering, why would God desire unbelievers to be deceived? Doesn't God want everyone to be saved? It's true. The Bible does say that God is not willing that any should perish. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. According to this verse, God does not want anyone to perish. And not only that, but God also gives everyone in the world a chance to be saved. Colossians 1 verse 23 says, If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. According to this verse, every single person in the world will have the gospel preached to them. That means that everyone will have the opportunity to be saved. The reason God sends the unsaved world strong delusion is because they denied him first. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 11 and 12 say, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Notice the reason God sends them strong delusion is because they did not believe the truth. And in order to not believe something, you must have heard about it previously. And what is the truth? The truth is that Jesus is the Son of God. God is going to bring the end of the world to a climax. Either worship God in the flesh or worship Satan in the flesh. There will be no other option. At this point in the story, you may be wondering, how is the Antichrist ever going to persuade the world that he is God in the flesh? What could someone possibly do to convince humanity that they are God? In order to understand Satan's master plan, it's necessary to understand Satan himself. The Bible tells us that the reason Satan fell was because he wanted to be similar to God. Isaiah 14, 14 says, in regards to Satan, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. According to this verse, Satan desires to be like God. 
You may be familiar with the Old Testament prophet named Daniel. He was the one who survived being thrown into a den of lions. One of the amazing characteristics of Daniel was his wisdom. God filled him with wisdom and understanding beyond anyone else in his generation. The Bible says in Daniel 5 verse 14, I have even heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. This is one of many verses that talks about the excellent spirit of wisdom which Daniel possessed. But, believe it or not, the Bible says that Satan will be even wiser than Daniel. Ezekiel 28 verse 3 says, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. According to this verse, Satan is even wiser than Daniel. This means that we should expect that whatever plan Satan does devise for the end times, it's going to be something spectacular. We, of course, are all familiar with the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. He was crucified on a cross, buried in a tomb, and rose again three days later. So what Satan is going to do is he is going to replicate this same exact miracle. Oftentimes, the King James Bible will use words and phrases that are distinct from the modern vocabulary we use today. One example is the phrase, is not. In the King James Bible, when someone is not, that means they have passed away. For example, in the Old Testament, Jacob is under the impression that his son Joseph was killed by a wild animal. Consequently, he says in Genesis 42, verse 36, And Jacob their father said unto them, me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and you will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. When Jacob says Joseph is not, what he means is that Joseph is dead. This same exact expression is used in the book of Revelation as well, but this time it's in regards to the Antichrist. The Bible says in Revelation 17, verse 8, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Notice that the beast, which is the Antichrist, was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. What this is referring to is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Antichrist. Satan is going to reproduce what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, and that is how he is going to be able to garner the worship of the entire world. Revelation 13 verse 3 says, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. According to this verse, the Antichrist will undergo a deadly wound of some sort, and afterwards he will be healed of that wound. The Bible does not tell us exactly what that wound will be, whether it be a gunshot or a stabbing, but it will be something you would expect to kill someone. Notice what occurs when the Antichrist wound is healed. It causes the entire world to wonder after him. The world is amazed that this man was able to come back to life. But notice where the Antichrist comes from when he does resurrect. The Bible says that he will ascend out of the bottomless pit. This means that when the Antichrist does resurrect, he's going to rise up from hell itself. Satan incarnate. That is Satan's master plan. He will allow himself to die and come back to life. That way, when he does claim to be God, the world will actually believe him.
The beginning of the tribulation will be a tumultuous period of time. It will be marked with a high frequency of natural disasters combined with world war. Jesus describes the beginning stages of the tribulation in Matthew 24, verse 7. For a nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. According to this verse, an abundance of natural disasters combined with warfare will mark the start of the tribulation. In the world we live in today, we are bombarded by the media by a constant report of all the natural disasters which take place throughout the world. When a hurricane destroys a distant coastline, we know about it. When there is a skirmish between countries, we know about it. When a disease breaks out in a foreign country, we know about it. Because of this constant influx of disaster news, many Christians have begun to wonder if we could possibly be in the tribulation period right now. While it's true the present state of the world is grim, the truth is that we are not in the tribulation period as of yet. The tribulation period, as mentioned before, has a distinct beginning and ending. There is a specific event that will mark the beginning of the tribulation, and that is the signing of an international treaty between the Antichrist and several other world leaders. Daniel 9 verse 27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. This covenant will mark the starting point of what is commonly referred to as Daniel's 70th week, and the tribulation period will begin, and last for approximately three and a half years. After signing this covenant, the Antichrist will begin to march towards Jerusalem. Luke 21 verse 20 says, And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. These armies that are compassing about Jerusalem are the armies of the Antichrist. You may be wondering, why would the Antichrist want to conquer Jerusalem? The reason is because he's going to declare himself to be God in the rebuilt temple. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4 says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Notice that when the Antichrist does declare himself to be God, he will do it in the temple. Once he has done that, he will set up an idol of himself in that same temple and demand all nations to worship it. This idol is commonly referred to as the abomination of desolation. Matthew 24 verse 15 says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Notice that the Antichrist is going to erect the statue of himself in the holy place and the holy place is a specific portion of the temple. One of the reasons we know that we are not in the tribulation yet is because the reconstruction of the temple has not begun yet. In short, the circumstances do not yet indicate that we are in the tribulation. We do not yet see one man rising to power. We do not see one man signing an international covenant and we do not yet see the temple being rebuilt in Jerusalem. When we begin to see these three events take place, then it will become safe to wonder whether we're in the tribulation or not. In order to fully understand the tribulation, it is important to understand another subject first, and that is the rapture. We know that Jesus Christ came to this world approximately 2,000 years ago. Since that time, the Bible tells us that Jesus has ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the throne of God. 1 Peter 3 verse 22 says in regards to Jesus, who has gone into heaven 
and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. According to this verse, Jesus is no longer on this earth. He has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. The rapture is an incredible event set in the future because it will be the day that Jesus Christ will actually come back to the earth. And the Bible even tells us how he is going to return. He will return in the clouds. Revelation 1 verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. According to this verse, when Jesus returns, he'll come in the clouds, allowing every person on earth to see him. You may be wondering, why would Jesus come back to earth a second time? What would cause him to leave his home in heaven? The reason is us. He is coming to take us with him into heaven. The Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 30, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. We know that this verse is talking about the second coming of Christ because it is referring to Jesus coming in the clouds. Then, look what the Bible says about his return in the very next verse. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. According to this verse, the reason Jesus is coming again is to gather together his elect. You may be wondering, who are his elect? The elect are Christians. He's going to gather together every single Christian to go back with him into heaven. It's important to note that only Christians will be taken with Jesus into heaven at the rapture. Everyone else who is not saved will have to remain here on earth. The Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 40, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Notice that only one of these farm workers was taken with Jesus into heaven. This is because only one of them was a believer. The best part about the rapture is that when Jesus does come again, we will be with him from that point forward. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. According to this verse, when we Christians meet Jesus in the clouds, we will be with him forever. The day of the rapture truly is a day to look forward to. For those of us who are still alive at that time, it will be the day we get to meet our Savior, Jesus Christ, for the very first time. Now that we understand both the tribulation and the rapture, the next step is to understand how they connect. This will require us to address a common misconception, and this misconception is that Jesus could return at any moment. One of the reasons why it is often thought that Jesus could come back at any moment is because the Bible says that no man knows exactly when he will return. The Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. According to this verse, there isn't a single man on earth who knows when Jesus will return. But just because no one knows when Jesus will return doesn't mean that he can return at any moment. The reason we know that Jesus cannot return tomorrow is because there are certain events on the biblical prophetic timeline which must take place first before he returns. For example, the Bible tells us that the Antichrist must be revealed first before the second coming of Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. 
According to this verse, the day of the rapture will not come until the man of sin be revealed. You may be wondering, who is the man of sin? The man of sin is the Antichrist. Today, we do not know who the Antichrist is. There are many different theories as to who he may be, whether it be a president or a pope, but the reality is these are just theories because he has not been revealed yet. A common teaching within Christianity today is that the rapture will take place right before the tribulation begins. This is what people commonly refer to as the pre-tribulation rapture. But unfortunately, this teaching is not true. The Bible is clear that the rapture will not take place before the tribulation. It will take place at the end of the tribulation. Matthew 24 verses 29 through 30 say, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. According to these verses, the Son of Man will come in the clouds after the tribulation. Another verse that disproves the pre-tribulation rapture is Revelation 7 verse 14. This verse is describing Christians in heaven after the rapture. Revelation 7 verse 14 says, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Notice that these Christians, which are now in heaven, came out of great tribulation. And the only way to come out of great tribulation is to be on the earth while it is taking place. To believe in the pre-tribulation rapture will preclude the Christian from understanding the beauty of the rapture. Because the most beautiful thing about the rapture is that it will take place just when things seem to be at their worst. When it appears as if Christians have no hope left on earth and that every last Christian will die, then their Savior will appear in the clouds. Matthew 24 verse 22 says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. According to this verse, if God did not shorten the tribulation, all Christians would die. The way God is going to shorten the tribulation is through the rapture. Luke 21 verse 28 says, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. The reason we're supposed to look up is because we're going to see Jesus coming in the clouds to rescue us. This is why the Bible says in Daniel 12:12, 12, 12, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. The reason we will be blessed if we make it to that day is because we'll see Jesus coming in the clouds. The doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture is somewhat ironic, because if all Christians get raptured before the tribulation, then the question becomes, who exactly is getting martyred? This false doctrine, just like any other, has an underlying purpose. According to the pre-tribulation rapture, the next thing we are told to expect is the arrival of Christ. But in reality, it's not Christ coming next. It's the Antichrist. The doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture is setting the stage for the appearance of the Antichrist himself. By understanding the correct timing of the rapture, we, as Christians, can prevent ourselves from getting caught off guard. Imagine stepping into a boxing ring and you think that the person waiting for you in the ring is your friend. But, in reality, that person seeks your life. Unfortunately, that is what is going to happen to many Christians when the tribulation begins. Because so many Christians are expecting to be raptured right before the persecution starts, once it actually does start, they are going to be very confused. 
But for those of us who understand that the rapture takes place after the tribulation, we will be ready for the test because we were expecting it and we were able to take the necessary steps to prepare both mentally and spiritually. So what does this mean for us Christians today? What should we do with the fact that we have this knowledge ahead of time? Should we buy a plot of land in the middle of nowhere and begin stockpiling goods? While there isn't any harm in preparing physically, the more important thing is to be prepared spiritually. The tribulation has been designed by God to push Christians to their limits. You may be familiar with the story of Peter denying Jesus. The night before Jesus' crucifixion, Peter denied that he knew the Lord three times. Luke 22 verse 57 says, And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. The reason Peter denied Jesus was because Peter was not yet willing to risk his own life for the Lord. But the Bible offers us a positive example as well. In the Old Testament, the king of Babylon, named King Nebuchadnezzar, built a statue to himself and demanded all nations to worship it. Daniel 3 verses 4 and 5 say, Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. Three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to worship the idol which King Nebuchadnezzar set up. They said, But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. There is coming a day in the future when Christians will be commanded to worship a statue as well, and they will be told that if they do not, they too will be killed. This is going to divide Christianity into two groups, those who are willing to die for their Savior and those who aren't. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Notice that before Jesus returns, there is going to be a great falling away from the faith. Christians are going to deny the Lord Jesus by the masses. The reason there is going to be a great falling away is because of the intensity of the persecution. And it's true, the tribulation will be a period of immense difficulty. But it will also be a time when many Christians do some of their greatest acts. Daniel 11 verse 32 says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. We must each ask ourselves this question. Are we going to be one of those Christians who falls away? Or are we going to be one of those Christians who performs exploits? If we desire to be part of the latter group, then the preparation needs to start now. Hebrews 10 verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As we see the day approaching and the world stage beginning to take shape, let that motivate us to read our Bible more than ever, to pray more than ever, 
and to encourage and exhort one another more than ever. That way, when the battle does come, we will be among those who remain faithful to Jesus Christ.